I have found in my reading of the Psalms, and I enjoy reading them, I think I could probably spend two years preaching through the Psalms, maybe more than that, that I find that the more you read the Psalms, the more you realize there's a lot of depth in the Psalms. There's a lot of theology in the Psalms. All of the major doctrines of Scripture are covered there. I think we find that the Psalms are very personal to us in terms of our personal needs and concerns. And Psalms 30 to 40 especially just kind of touch on a lot of, a lot of things that go on in our life. Psalms 30 to 40, all of them are Psalms of David. Now, as you read the Psalms, you'll arrive, you'll arrive at one conclusion. There's the Psalms of David. They're the Psalms of Asaph. They're the Psalms of Hezekiah. But the predominance of the Psalms are Psalms of David. And here's Psalms 30 to 40. They're all written by David. Every one of David's Psalms were written during a significant time in his life. They may have been a time of elation, or it could have been a time when he was at rock bottom. Whatever it may be, they were written by David after a significant event. Um, this evening, as we look at Psalms 30, we notice the superscription here tells us that it was a psalm or song written at the dedication house of David. Now, this is one of the psalms that is called the Song Psalms, okay? It's a song psalm. Colossians 3.16 tells us, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, uh, singing with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Uh, singing and the psalms go together. The Hebrews, they, 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 they not only knew the psalms, they not only memorized the psalms, but they, they, they sang the psalm. Um, the Hebrews, they, they, if you, a lot of times when they wrote the psalms, they, they wrote it according, or the writer wrote it according to a Hebrew acrostic, according to the, uh, the Hebrew alphabet there, using that as an acrostic to remind himself of what he wanted to say there. And this is the first of the psalms that David sings, that he turns into a song. A lot of times the songs that the psalms he wrote, they were sung, they were, they were written according to, with a musical, uh, to be accompanied by a musical instrument. We read over there in, so, in uh, 1 Samuel 16, how uh, how David was uh, uh, gifted in music and how uh, uh, Saul, uh, Saul, King Saul had him there and he would use a harp or whatever the musical instrument was and he'd play it. It may be that he'd even written some psalms at that time and was singing them to, to King Saul. This psalm was a psalm that he sang and uh, it's a very special one. You'll notice something else about the superscription. It says it was sung at the dedication of the house of David. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to read that, but you ought to pause for just a minute because you have to ask the question, what house is he talking about here? What house is he talking about there? Now, it, we, we know that David did not build the temple. Uh, the Bible tells us he prepared abundantly before his death and laying up a substantial amount of money, and Solomon, dedicated, Solomon got to build the temple during his time. So it, was it the, was it the, the what, you know, it, we know it wasn't for a temple that he, that he built, and so was it for, was it for Solomon to, to sing? And as you read through 1 Kings and you read through uh, uh, you know, 2 Chronicles, we don't have any inference there that tells us that Solomon may have sung this psalm. Now, he could have, but we don't have any inference there. So I, I don't believe it, was, uh, it, was, it had anything to do with the, uh, the, 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 the temple that, um, uh, that Solomon had to build. And so the question comes up, well, what, about, what, can, what about 2 Samuel 7? It says this was a psalm that was written at the dedication of the house of David. Well, uh, it could have been David's house. I mean, I don't, I don't want to rule that out in 2 Samuel 7. It could have been David's house. But as you read the context of the psalm, going into the psalm and going through the psalm, David goes through some extreme times in his life. He's gone down to the pit. He's been in times of danger. He's gone through some trials. He's gone through some extremities. He's gone through some rough stop, uh, rough spots. Of he's gone through, he's going through some dark times there. Now, if you read the, if you read first and second Samuel, aside from uh, Saul chasing after him, uh, which that was pretty much all gone with by the time he built his house there, because the kingdom was at a time of peace. Uh, I, I, you know, I, it's hard for me to correlate in Psalms 30 that this had something to do with the dedication of David's actual physical house. Now, it could have it could have been, but I, I, don't, I don't see that there just from how the context of everything reads here because this is not only a psalm and not only a song, it's a supplication. We find David praying here. So what, what could it mean? What could this mean that this was a song and a psalm written at the dedication house of David? Well, I'll tell you what I think it means. And I think Charles Spurgeon came to the same conclusion, and, and I concur with Charles Spurgeon says on this. I think if you take your Bible and look at 2 Samuel 24, 2 Samuel 24 takes us in the latter years of David's life. This is after his sin with Bathsheba, after Uriah has died, after Absalom has died. It's at the, it's at the latter end of David's life. And in 2 Samuel 24, the Bible tells us there that, that, that David uh, decided one day that he wanted to go and number all the men of war. And so he commissions Joab 
to get all the, the, the men, of, you know, his mighty men, and to go out through all the land of Israel. And so they went from as far north as Dan, as far south to Beersheba. I mean, that's the entire context of Israel. And it, the Bible tells me, my memory's right, I think it took him seven or eight months to do this. Now, Joab tried to talk him out of it. He says, you know, this is the Lord's army. Why do you need to know? And uh, it, God didn't tell David to go number it, but David wanted to number, he wanted to find out the exact number of his armies, how many men were, were under his command, mainly out of vanity, pride, and narcissism. I mean, David was just this place where he was kind of in a lull. It was kind of peaceful for him. And he just kind of thought, well, you know, we, I got a mighty army here. And so, you know, Joab couldn't talk him out of it. So Joab took some of his key men and they went all throughout the land for seven months. They came back with a report. He says, well, king, he says, in Israel alone, you've got 800,000 men of war, that men that can, valiant men that can draw the sword. And in Judah, you've got 500,000 men, valiant men that can draw the sword. And you think with me for just a minute, he had 1.3 million uh, soldiers that that, that work for him, just a small little country of Israel. That's amazing. 1.3 million men that represented the army there. Well, when he got the report there, David was looking forward with anticipation for several months and getting the number. But somehow, when he heard that number, God had been working on him. And the Bible tells us his heart smote him. When his heart smote him, 2 Samuel 24 says, David, David felt remorse. And he said, I have sinned. This is what he said. He said, I have sinned and I've done foolishly. Well, he thought that, you know, he made that statement there, and I think he said it to God, but I think God knew his heart that David wasn't fully repentant because the next morning God sent him the prophet Gad. When the prophet Gad came knocking at his door, I think David knew that something wasn't right. He knew that God was dealing with him concerning the numbering of his men, about the exercise of pride, the exercise of vanity in his life, trying to find out how big he was and how substantial he was and how monumental he was. And maybe he's thinking about because he was in his 60s at that time, he's thinking about the legacy see he would leave behind and how mighty his men of war was. Well, Gad came to him and he said, he said, David, you didn't do well. And the Lord sent me to you. He says, you know, God's going to have to chasten you, son. And he says, I'm going to, God told me you have three choices to make. Now, thank God, God loved David enough that he gave him three choices. You and I don't get any choices in chastening him, man. I mean, when it comes, it comes. Amen. And so God told him, he said, now listen, chastening number one, choice number one, you have option number one, you could choose from is that we send you seven years of famine. And, uh, you know, they, they went through famine before, and he didn't want to go through that. Seven years of famine. He said, choice or option number two is, he says, you know, I'll have your enemies come after you, and they'll chase you for three months. Or he said, option number three, I'll send a pestilence or a plague in the land. I want you to think with me like this, kind of like a COVID experience, if you would, but far much worse. And, or maybe think of like the plagues of Egypt there. That's what a pestilence is, is a plague. He said, I'll send you a plague for three days. Well, you know, he's given three, three, three options. All of them are bad. I mean, there's not, you know, not, none of them are really good choices choices. One is seven years of famine. You're talking about people, you know, people starving and, and the land being, being barren and drought and all those things. Seven years of famine. You're talking about the potential of three, three, three months of his enemies chasing after him, defeating him and chasing him again. And David had enough of the chase. I mean, he'd been chased by Saul enough there. He didn't want to go through that again. He still had scars and memories about that. And so he says, he says, you know what? I think I'm going to, the one I'm going to choose, let me fall into the hand of the Lord and not the hand of man. Because he said, the Lord's mercies are great. He says, I'll take the one where God, let, let God do, do what he has to do with him. And I kind of think that Dave was thinking this way. He said, I'm going to take the path of least resistance. I'm going to take the one that's the least amount of time that sounds the most severe. He says, God's mercies are great. And so when he did so, he was basically telling the prophet Gab, you let the Lord know, I'll take the three days pestilence. David had no idea what the three days pestilence was going to mean. When that, when he said he gave the consent to that, the three day pestilence meant this angel came from God, a death angel came with a sword in his hand. If you remember the story there, that angel angel came. And whatever this pestilence was that swept through the land of Israel, seven, by the end of the third day, 70,000 of David's men died. 70,000 men. I mean, you think me for just a minute. 70,000 men, their blood was on the hand of David because David had sinned. Now remember when David, David, his heart smote him, he said, I've sinned and done foolishly. Go back and read 2 Samuel 24. By the end of that third day, after 70,000 men had died, and I'm talking about husbands and sons and fathers, etc., Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. David said this. He said, "He says I have sinned and I've done wickedly." 
Big change in tone. I have sinned and done foolishly to saying I've sinned and done wickedly. God stayed the hand of the, of the, of the, of the angel there. Well, when he did so, they, God was not done yet. He said, okay, David, there's still more to do. He says, I need you to make an altar. I need you to erect an altar. I need you to offer some a bird sacrifices on there. And he said, I want you to go to the threshing floor of Verona. Now, the threshing floor of Verona was on the top of a mountain. That mountain we know as Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah we know we have our first mention Mount Moriah in, in, in Genesis 22 because in Genesis 22 that's where God told Abraham to take his son Isaac and to offer him as a sacrifice. God was testing Abraham to see whether or not he, he would obey God. He was testing Abraham that if his faith was in the everlasting God because the last revelation God gave to Abraham was in the previous chapter in, in Genesis 21 when he revealed himself to Abraham as El Olam. And you, and you trace this in Abraham's life. Every major theological revelation that God gave to Abraham was, was a step up in his spiritual life. He first came to him as a shield and exceeding great as, as the most high God, then the shield and exceeding great reward. And now we go to later on as the God who sees and now as the everlasting God. And Abraham's a much older man there. You know, Abraham's about, probably about 130 years old and Isaac's about 30 years of age at the time. He's taking his, his son that he loved very much and God said, I want you to offer your only son as a sacrifice. And with a heavy heart, he took his son up there, but with great faith in God. God, God wanted to test to see if, if he would pass the test, and Abraham did pass the test. Well, my, Mount Moriah became very, very prominent, and if you would, it was sacred in that sense there. Now, God didn't do anything else on Mount Moriah that was significant till we get to 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24, uh, there's a man by Arona. He owns some land up there. Arona did his threshing up there. He had, his, he had his wheat fields, and he went there, and he had a threshing floor where he where, where he threshed his wheat. And so he says, I want, he, you need to go up there and offer an altar there. So he goes up there and, and, and Arona sees him and he goes up to King. He says, King, what would you like? He says, listen, I've come to buy your threshing floor because I need to build an altar here. And Arona has such a heart for God. He said, King, you can have the whole land. He, can, he said, you can have my threshing floor. Not only that, you can have the animals and you can have the, uh, you can have the instruments. I mean, Arona, just, just by himself, that's a message all by himself. The, 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 the charitableness and the giving and the liberation of Arona wanting to offer that. He said, God, he said, King, God sent you up here for that. He said, listen, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do transact business with you. He said, you can have the whole thing. I'm gonna give it to you there. He says, no, I need to buy it of you. He says, you know why? He says, I will not take of that of you. He says, I will not offer to the Lord that which just cost me nothing. David's heart was heavy because of all those men who died, all the bloodshed that happened, the many widows that were, were, were the women became widows because of David's sin. And so David went and bought that for, I think the Bible says for 50 shekels of of silver, he, he bought that lamb. And the Bible says that the conclusion, 2 Samuel 24, which ends all of 2 Samuel, it says there that David, there at that altar site, that he, he offered burnt offerings and sacrifices, etc., 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 on there. I believe... I believe this psalm, Psalm 30, as we look at the psalm and song of the dedication of David, I believe was written at the occasion when David made that altar and he had an envisionment that one day the house of God, the temple of the Lord would be built there because that's where, that's where Solomon would build Solomon's temple, right there on that side of that mountain. So when it says there is a song that was sung at the dedication house, I believe everything here fits the context of David's heart as his heart was broken from what he did and getting right with God and everything that happened there. So with that in mind, I want you to go with me now and look with me here in Second Sam. Look at Psalms 30 here. Now in Psalms 30, I want you to see some things here because it, see, it speaks to us about the fact this was a song that was sung. David sang this song, uh, this psalm. He wrote this psalm and he starts off in verse 1 by saying, I will extol thee, O Lord. Now we have to remember one thing. There's a, we're going to see a lot of David's experiences in this psalm. But the first thing we want to make note of here, David wrote this to say, Lord, I write this to praise you. I will extol thee, O Lord. Listen, tonight we ought to be a people that praise the Lord. Amen. We ought to be a people that praise God for whom all blessings flow. We ought to praise Praise the Lord for his goodness. Amen. We ought to praise the Lord when we have goodness. We ought to praise God when we have badness. We ought to praise God when we're feeling good. We ought to praise God when we're feeling bad. We ought to praise God for good health. We ought to praise God for bad health. We ought to praise God for souls getting saved. We ought to praise God those days, even souls don't get saved, that the gospel seed was sown. Amen. We need to praise the Lord. He said, I will extol thee, O Lord. He said, I will extol thee, Lord, because for thou has lifted me up. That's why Brother, Brother Vaughn chose our opening hymn tonight. He lifted me. Why? Because Jesus Christ saw you and I that we were sinking in miry clay and when Jesus got a hold of us he lifted us up if you wouldn't he put our feet on a solid rock listen we're not sick anymore he lifted us up and he holds us up amen 
Thank God for that this evening. So he said, I write this to praise the Lord. But we'll notice some things here. In this psalm, the first thing we see is David's sorrow. Now keep in mind, he wrote this psalm to praise God. And David is reflecting on his sorrow. Now we have some overtones about his sorrow in verses 2 and verse 3. And verse 5 and verse 9, look at some of the words. He's, when he says, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee. Verse 3, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, thou shalt not go down the pit. Verse 5, he speaks about the anger of God. That's why I believe that this, this, this psalm was written after, after the occasion there at Mount Moriah when he bought the field or bought the threshing floor from Arona because he was sensing the, the anger of God because he did mess up. He said his anger endureth but a moment. He talks about weeping that endured for a night and joy coming in the morning. Now you read all of that and we go on to verse 9. He said, he's, and, he, and he's just reflecting here, verse 8. He said, I cry unto thee, O Lord, and unto thee I made my supplication. And he said, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Listen, David, David's writing, he's writing to Psalm, reflecting on his sorrow. Now, what sorrow? Number one, he's the sorrow of death. I remind you this evening, death is our last enemy. Death is the enemy of life. Death is the opposite of life there. David's reflecting on the sorrow of heart and incredible grief he had as 70,000 men had died. Dr. George W. Truitt pastored First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas, for many years. Dr. Truitt was somewhat of a quiet man. He went hunting with one of the men of his church, and the story is told that Dr. Truitt accidentally shot the man while he was hunting, and the man died. Dr. Truitt was so heartbroken by that. They say that the remainder of his ministry in life it was very difficult for the man to smile because he just was so heartbroken that he had taken a man's life. He didn't do it intentionally, and he, didn't, he wasn't tried for mass or anything like that. It was accidental. But he just, just it consumed him. It bothered him that it happened here. And David's reflecting on the sorrow of heart and incredible grief he had as 70,000 men died. His heart smote him that he had sinned and done wickedly. He was overcome with great sorrow. Sons, husband, father all died because of his sin. Listen, David was sorry because of death. Listen, we sorrow because of death. That's why we have 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that as we grieve over the past of loved one, we're to be reminded there will be a reunion one day for everyone that's saved. There will be a reunion. I remind you tonight, we have many of us in this room, we've got lost relatives. We have lost family members. Listen, there are is no reunion for unsaved people. There's no reunion in heaven for unsaved people. Listen, if you and I go, go to heaven and they're not saved, there's no reunion for them up in heaven. By the way, there's no such thing as a reunion in hell. There's only reunion in heaven because the Bible says we'll be caught up together with them in the air. I want to tell you tonight, that's why it should be incumbent upon us to move with a sense of urgency. Every lost family member we have to try to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't put off to tomorrow what we can do today. David was sorrowing because of death. But notice something else. David was sorrowing also because of his death. Descent. As good men were dying, something died inside of David. David's conscience smote him about men that died who should not have died. It could be not only those 70,000 men, but David's conscience may have smote him about what happened to Uriah the Hittite. I don't think he ever got over that. I don't think his mind ever got over the fact that his son Absalom died. I mean, David experienced much grief over key men in his life that had passed away. And David writes here about the pit. He writes here in verse 3 about, about having gone to the grave. I'll say more about that in a minute. And he says that how God, he felt like God had kept him from going to the pit. In Genesis 37, we have the account of Joseph's brethren casting him into a pit. A pit was a big hole in the ground. Normally, a pit was dug out, dug out to catch animals. You know, or if you wanted to catch a predator there. 
And uh, Joseph's brethren, they knew there was a pit there, and they threw David, uh, Joseph in there. And Joseph couldn't get his way out there. And listen, the pit, there's no water, there's no food. If anything, if you're left to die there, you're going to either die because of the elements, you're going to die because a, a predator might jump in there and consume you there. And so Joseph knew that he was in a bad place here. David felt like his life was in a pit. Spiritually speaking, he felt like he had thrown and fallen into a pit, and he was on this descent. He was going down. Now, when you fall into a pit, when you fall into a pit, it's a hard fall. And when you fall into a pit, you are stuck. And if you fall into a pit, the likelihood, unless somebody can get you out of there, you're going to die. The pit describes hitting rock bottom. David said, listen, I'm, I'm falling into the pit, but thank God he didn't go down to the bottom of the pit. But he felt like he was in the pit. He felt like he was near rock bottom. Listen, you read the Bible. Joseph knew what it was like to be rock bottom. Uh, Jonah knew what it was like to be rock bottom. And David could experience here that he felt like he was going down, to, he was descending into the pit. And he thought, man, if I go any further down, I'm going I'm I'm to be in trouble. Look at verse 9 again. He said, what profit is there in my blood? When I go down the pit, he said, Lord, he said, if I go down the pit and I shed my blood there, if I burst the sun inside there, what profit is that? How does that do any good? How does that glorify you, Lord? How does that, how does that help the kingdom? How does that help the men who, who have died? He says, shall the dust praise thee? Shall declare thy truth? Listen, David was in this place where he was rock bottom. He remembered where it was like, what, like what was there. And something died inside him when all those men died. Listen, David had sorrow. I remind you tonight, we're going to go through times of sorrow, times of heartache, times of, of grieving, times the situation to come. It may not be because of the passing of someone, but our heart might be grieved because of something that was happening there. I say, I say this evening, he felt like he was in a grave and he needed to come out of it. We see David's sorrow, but notice secondly, we see David's sovereign. Now David was the king of Israel. Kings have full decision-making authority. The ultimate decision, everything falls in the hands of a king. Kings are in charge of kingdoms. A king's hand motions can determine your life or your death, your success or your failure. David was a great king. He was a powerful king. He was a wise king. But in Psalms 30, we realize that David was in submission to a greater king. Amen? Psalms 30 speaks about David's submission to the Lord. The word, the name Lord, is found 10 out, of 12, out of, 10 out of 12 times in this passage. 10 times he refers to God as Lord. The Lord who's in control. The Lord who is, who is my God. The Lord who is almighty. Uh, uh, he's talking about Adonai, the Lord Adonai. He says, and he uses the phrase, O Lord and O Lord thou my God. O Lord and O Lord my God is used five times. Listen, listen what he says here. He's acknowledging God's sovereignty by calling him Lord. He acknowledges God's sovereignty by this phrase, thou hast. Thou hast. Notice in verses 1, 2, 3, 7, 11, he says things like this. Verse 1, thou hast lifted me up, and thou hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. Verse 2, thou hast healed me. Verse 3, thou hast brought me up. He says in verse 3, thou hast kept me alive. You go down a little further here, and we get to verse 7. He says, uh, he says by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain strong. Uh, thou didst hide thy face. He said, uh, he said in verse 11 there, he said, uh, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into, into, into dancing. Thou hast put off my, my, my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Now listen, kings are used to exerting power. Kings are used to doing things in other people's lives. David was at a place where he was vulnerable. David was at a place where he was weak. He's acknowledging the sovereign God in his life. He's saying, you're the one who helped me. You're the one who healed me. You're the one who lifted me up. You're the one that turned my mourning into dancing. You're the one that turned my, turned my weeping into, in, into, 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 into delight, into joy. You're the one that kept me, from, kept me alive. You're the one that's kept me there. He's acknowledging God in all this. He's acknowledging God is in control. Listen, kings and people with power and people with strong personalities, they like to be in control. They all love being in control. Listen, all of us who have a leadership capacity, we like to be in control of things. But David knew at this at that point of his life, he didn't have any control over things. He didn't have control over the, the death angel. He didn't have control over God's chasing. He didn't have control over anything. We find David in complete submission to the Lord. He acknowledges God is in control. He acknowledges God's power and provision. He acknowledges God's divine plan for his life. He acknowledges that he needed God to make decisions for him instead of him making making decisions for himself. God broke David to teach him there's only one king. And there is still only one king. His name's Jesus Christ. Amen? I want to ask you a question tonight. 
Are you someone who's controlling? Are you someone that likes to be in control? To be at the forefront? I think we're like that. We need to pay special attention to Psalm 30 and realize how David learned at an older age in a very hard way who his sovereign is. Oh, let's remember day in, day out, we have a sovereign God. God who's in control. God who's all-powerful. God who's all-knowing. A God that we must submit ourselves to day in and day out. Oh, let's turn our, our thoughts and our mind and commit everything to the Lord. We see David's sorrow. We see David's sovereign. Notice in verses 2, 8, and 10, we see David's supplication. Now, this is a prayer. When he mentions about his prayer here, it's a, a prayer of great urgency. He said in verse 2, O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee. In verse 8, he said, I cried to thee, O Lord. Unto the Lord I made supplication. In verse 10, he said, Hear, O Lord, have mercy upon me. Hey, you ever prayed like that? You ever prayed like that? I mean, you get right down to business with God. I mean, you're just, you're just so bottled up with emotion. I mean, just you're by yourself, you and God. And you've closed that closet behind you. You say, Lord, I cry to thee. I mean, your, your, your voice is, is trembling. And hot tears are coming down your eyes. And your chest is heaving. Because you're so full of emotion. Because you know you're in a life and death situation. You know that moment that you got to get a hold of God right then and there. You know, you can't wait till tomorrow. you got to get a hold of God right then and there. You said, God, I'm crying to you. Oh, Lord, my God, I need you. You ever been there? You ever prayed like that? I mean, David, David's teaches the urgency of prayer. And not to be, just come to God as, 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 that, that, Lord, I need you right then and there. And we see David here that he's making a prayer that is very urgent and a very needy prayer there. What did he pray for? What did he cry out to the Lord for? Well, verse 2 tells us one of the things he prayed for. One of the things he prayed for, he cried out to the Lord for healing. He said, I cry unto thee, and thou hast healed me. I've taken this verse many times. And I've applied it and used it for some of God's people going through severe health trials. I've used this, and I use a verse in Jeremiah 17. But the context of healing here is not for physical healing. The context for healing here is about spiritual healing. David had sinned. He said, I've sinned and done wickedly. Listen, we need to be at the place in our life where we realize all of our sins are wicked. Amen? All of our sins are wicked. Not to cover up our sins. Every sin is wicked because that's how God sees our sin. The Bible says, Thou art of holier eyes, pure eyes, and that can behold evil. I remind you tonight, sin is a disease. Sin can be infectious. Sin's like a cancer that spreads through our soul and through our life. Sin mars us, sin wounds us, sin injures us, sin scars us. David had the sin and disease of pride. David had the sin and disease of presumption. David had the sin and disease of foolishness. David had the sin and disease of hypocrisy. David had the sin, the sin and disease of just, of just uh, a lustfulness. I mean, you name it. David knew he had sin, and he cried unto the Lord. And so you can imagine they're about up there on, on, the, on the threshing floor up the, where he bought that. He bought that land off of, of Verona, and he bought it for 50 shekels, whatever it was. He paid a price for it. And now the transaction occurred. This now, this land belonged to, belonged to Israel, belonged to David. And David took that land, and he looked at it, and there was threshing wheat. But right at that moment, he realized, 
realized that place would go from threshing wheat to be threshing his soul because he realized he had to do some business with God. And he had to painstakingly with time build an altar there out of stones. And he would build this altar and he'd put a fire there and we'd bring the sacrifice and he'd bring, the, he'd bring a whole animal there and offer as a bird sacrifice to God and offer this sin offering and burnt offerings and peace offerings so forth. He would offer these offerings up there. I mean, great sacrifice, great expense, great cost. And David's thinking as, the, as, the, as that burnt offering's going up, and the smoke and, and the pungentness of the, of the animal burning there, filling up his nostrils. It reminded him of his sin. And David's thinking here, oh, man, I'm so messed up. He said, man, the wound is so great and the hurt is so big and the injury is so bad. And he said, Lord, he cried to the Lord. He said, Lord, I need you, Lord. Lord, I need your forgiveness. And Lord, I need your cleansing. And Lord, I need your, I need your washing of my life. He said, would you cleanse me and wash me? And thank God the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, washed away all of our sins. Amen. And he could say with great faith and confidence, thou hast healed me. I want to tell you this evening when we come to God, we confess our sins to him. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of our men several years ago, and I used to meet for prayer on Mondays. And both our wives had some similarities that both of them had similar types of cancer. And I'd always ask his brother to go first. He'd kneel at the couch. I'd kneel at my chair. And he'd pray something like this. He said, Lord, for my wife, for Mrs. Fong, he would name the specific parts of the body where they had the cancer, and he would pray this, Lord, cleanse that air of their body that no cancer cells would recur. And I always used to think as he prayed for that press, that, Lord, thank you for answering his prayer. He's so, you're so good, Lord. Amen. And David looked at his soul. His soul had been punctured with sin. And what he did, he took responsibility that the blood of 70,000 men was on his hands because of the foolishness that he did. David cried to the Lord for healing. Maybe you're battling with some sin tonight. Maybe you're battling with some sin you don't have victory over. Why don't you just take a moment and let the Holy Spirit of God speak to you about that sin or sins. Why don't you look at the scars, those sins. Let me tell you, every sin leaves a scar, and every sin wounds us, and every sin hurts us, and every sin injures us, and every sin mars us. Why don't you look at that sin and realize you need cleansing, and you need forgiveness, and Lord, until you get cleansing and forgiveness, you can't have the healing that God promises. That's why the psalmist wrote in Psalms 103, Thou forgivest all my iniquities, thou healest all my diseases. Listen, sin is a spiritual disease. David cried out for healing, but notice in verse 10, David cried out for help. Hear, O Lord, have mercy upon me. Be thou my helper. I think he prayed that during those three long, grueling days of the pestilence. I think he prayed that as he was going through the transaction of buying that threshing floor from Arona. (laughs) <laughs> Excuse me. I think he prayed that as he was offering sacrifices at that altar. I cried unto thee, O Lord, be thou my helper. So when you get so broken, you realize that things are so bad, you need God's help. Amen. We need God's help. We need God's help to get out of the hole. We need God's help to get out of the pit. Hey, listen, you need God's help to get out of depression. You need God's help to get out of discouragement. You need God's help to get out of that, that, uh, that, that attitude that you can't do. Listen, you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you. Amen? Get out of that. You need God's help to get out of a pessimistic mindset. You need God's help to get out of a, that state of doubtfulness and, and lack of faith in God. We need, we need the Lord's, and then we need God's help. We need God's help to overcome sin. We need God's help to be gracious. We need God's help to experience his mercy. He says, Lord, have mercy upon me. I'm telling you tonight, if you feel like you don't need help tonight, you need God's help. Let us not get to the place where we ever think we don't need God. Listen, we've got a lot of things going on in our church right now that you don't even know about. I want to tell you right now, we need God's help. 
We need God's help for 2024. We need God's help to reach our area for Christ. We need God's help to reach our families with the gospel. We need God's help in homes that are disturbed and messed up and when there's friction and fighting and all these things. We need God's help. You need God's help in your marriage. You need God's help as a child. You need God's help to be obedient. You need God's help to be a man. You need God's help to be a woman. You need God's help to be a father. You need God's help to be a husband. You need God's help to be a wife. You need God's help to be a mother. Listen, you need God's help to overcome lustful temptations. You need God's help to overcome drug addiction. You need, need God's help to overcome addictive habits. You need God's help to overcome a mind of thinking that's not thinking about Jesus Christ. David cried out for help. He cried out for mercy. He cried out for deliverance. David sings about his sorrow, and David sings about his prayer, and David, David sings about, about his sorrow. But notice, we just look at David's song as a whole. This is about David's song. It's a song of praise. It's a song as we read her that remember God's holiness. It was a song of thanksgiving. It's a song that celebrated things only God could do for David, only God could do for you and me. Let me give you some things he was singing about. Number one, look at verse three. First, he was singing because God brought him up, brought him up from the grave. Thou hast brought up me, brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. He wasn't literally buried, but he equated the sorrow that he had as if he died. Baptism symbolizes death. Baptism symbolizes we were dead in sin. But thank God we don't stand in the water, amen? We come out of the water, we come out of the water, it also represents resurrection. And resurrection represents life, amen? And resurrection represents eternal life. And resurrection represents the power of life through Jesus Christ because he is the source of all life, amen? God brought him up from the grave. Listen, God brought you up out of the grave, amen? Amen. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those wings which are above, for Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Hey, listen, when, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, he says, come out. Then he said, he told those people around him, take off those old stinky grave clothes. Listen, some of us need to get rid of the old stinky grave clothes. You're, out of the, you're not in the grave anymore. He took you, listen, he, up from the grave he arose. And listen, he took you out of the grave. He took you out of sin. And he saved you and he made you a holy person, a child of his. Listen, you don't have to go back to the old grave stuff. Don't live among the tombs like that demoniac did. Come out of the tombs and realize you can live among people and be alive in Jesus Christ. Celebrating, singing about the fact God brought him up from the grave. And listen, let's get rid of dead things and let's be around living things. Amen. That's why, why you want to be in a church that's not dead. You want to be in a church that's alive. You don't want to be around Christians that are dead. You want to be around Christians that are alive. You don't want to be part of a ministry that's dying. You want to be part of a ministry that's alive. Amen. Second, he was seen because God kept him alive. Ask the question, how many of you thankful you're alive? And I think that's special meaning for David in verse 3 because uh, he was a much older man. He was entering the fourth quarter of his life. How many of you have had near accidents that you escaped? You thank God he kept you alive. Amen? Amen. Yes, sir. He keeps us alive because he has a purpose that he wants to fulfill in our lives. God still had things he wanted David to do. Thirdly, he was singing because of God's mercies and grace. Read verse 5 with me. This is a great verse. Notice a contrast of words. He speaks about God's anger. Then he speaks about God's favor. He says his anger endureth but a moment. How, how fast is a moment? Quick. We used the phrase, just a moment, right? He said, now God... God had to deal with him, but David equated things theologically on how God operates. He says, anger endureth but a moment. Hey, some of you tonight, maybe you grew up in a home where, you, where the guilt trip was put on you for everything. You were told negative things. You are told you couldn't do anything, and you're a failure, and you're a loser. And so you grow up now, and you're an adult, and uh, 
you know, you just have this guilt. You're always feeling this guilt that God never forgives you. God can't wash your sins. Let me tell you what. David reminds us one thing here. His anger endures but a moment. But in his favor is for life. There's a difference. Amen? His favor is his grace, his mercies. He says his favor endures for life. In anger for a moment, life forever. Then he says this. He talks about weeping and joy. He says, in night and day. Now, night and day are different. Weeping and joy are different. He says, weeping may endure not for a night. And a lot of us in this room, we've had, we've had nights where we've wept. But he says, he looked forward to the morning because joy came in the morning. Amen. Joy cometh in the morning. He says, this, nights are hard, but joy cometh in the morning. He's talking about here the mercies and grace of God. God's mercies. He's reflecting on the mercy of God. All of verse 5 is talking about God's wonderful grace and sustaining him. He found grace and more grace. God was there for him. Look later on, he says in verse 11, Thou hast turned from me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. He says, you've changed me out, Lord. He says, you took off that old sackcloth I was wearing, and you put on the, you put on the garment of gladness. And he said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, 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 I'm not mourning anymore. I'm, I'm rejoicing and thanking God for the Listen, we sing because of God's mercies and grace. We need to sing because of God's mercies and grace. Like the, like the psalm said, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Amen? But there's something else he was singing about. Notice fourth, he was, he was singing so that through the end his glory would sing praise to God. Look at the very last verse, verse 12. To the end. Who's end? David's end. To the end that my glory. Now, that's interesting. David talked about his glory when he had been so humbled. Now, what is your glory? What is your glory? Your glory is Jesus Christ, amen? He says, to the end, my glory may sing praise to thee. And he's saying, there's no greatness in me. I don't even want to pretend there's greatness in me. He said, to the end, that my glory will sing praise to thee. He says, everything about me is about glorifying God. About singing to the Lord and glorifying. Listen, glorify God in your life, Amen. Glorify God in your singing. Glorify God in your attitude. Glorify God in what you're doing. He said, to the end, that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. Listen, there's a place to be silent. But when it's time to praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. And he says, oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. David's sorrow. David's sovereign. David's supplication. David's song, but as we close tonight, would you notice David's steadfastness? This psalm was written after those men were, had died. After the pestilence was done. After he had been offering, he had offered these sacrifices to God. That land was dedicated as the future site where Solomon's temple would be built. And David would prepare, the Bible says David prepared abundantly before his death for the construction of that temple. And we read about that in 1 Chronicles. David said this after he reflected in verse 5 about God's favor and the joy that comes in the morning. He shifts to where he's right then and there at. Because he's in a moment of peace. He's at this place of realizing he's rich, he's successful, he's prosperous. In all likelihood, he was the greatest king alive at that time. The Bible says he served his generation by the will of God. The Bible teaches us that David was a very prosperous. He had an abundance of wealth that he passed on to Solomon. And Solomon was a good son. He increased on it and he added to that. But David's just talking right then and there about his life. Notice what he says in verse 6. And in my prosperity... In my blessings, in my success, in my achievements, in those new benchmarks, in those new establishments. He said, uh, he said, in my prosperity. Now, my question I want to ask you tonight, what does prosperity do to you? He said, in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. He said, success is not going to move me in a different direction. Success is not going to move me from God. Success is not going to cause me to stop praying. Success is not going to cause me to change my church. Success is not going to cause me to change my Bible. Success is not going to cause me to change my Bible reading. Success is not going to cause me to have less church. In fact, if anything, he says, I shall never be moved. I want to ask you tonight, what has success, what is success doing to you? 
David said, I shall never be moved. I'm going to tell you tonight, in your success, don't be moved in your doctrine. In your success, don't be moved in conviction. I want to say in success, don't be moved from being Baptist. I want to say in success, don't be moved from being a soul winner. In success, don't be moved from being involved in helping us to have evangelistic emphasis Sunday after Sunday after Sunday of people getting saved. David said in my prosperity, I shall not be moved. Yeah, David was an old man. And yeah, David could have started collecting his dividends and the coupons. And David could have just sat on his laurels and gone on. He said, no, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move from being a man of God. I'm not going to be moving from my convictions. I'm not going to be moving from the word of God. I'm not changing my direction. It doesn't matter which way the wind blows. I'm not moving. I'm not moving from Jerusalem. I'm not moving from this palace. I'm not moving from being a righteous king. I'm not going to be moving from my faith. I'm not going to be moving from trusting God. He said, in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. And I want to tell you right now, if you're going through a season right now where everything's great, your prayer time is great, your devotions are great, your Bible reading is great, and your love of the Lord is great, your ministry is going great, you need to determine to set yourself down on your knees tonight and say, in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. David speaks here of his conviction. Hey, there's two big events in our lives that reveal what's inside of us. Listen very carefully. Two big events that happen to us that reveal what's in us. The first is what does trouble, trials, and suffering reveal about us? What does it reveal about us? Do we really trust God? Or are we living on anxiety and painkillers? Do we really trust God? Trouble reveals what we're really all about. Secondly, success and prosperity reveal what we're all about. David continued to be successful, but he had a conviction. In my prosperity, I should never be moving. Hey, listen, students, you get your straight A's. You do your community service. You apply to your colleges. You go to Bible college, and, and you do very well. You get your three-point whatever it may be, your 4.0 and magna cum laude and all the other things that we may go with that. And you go into secular college and you do very well. Let me tell you tonight, don't let your 4.0, don't let your grade point average, don't let your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, your doctor's degree, I don't care what degree it is, don't let that move you out away, away from the church. Don't let that move you from God. Don't let that move you to, to going away from things and having less involvement. You say in your heart, in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. And then Doris David gives us a contrast. In verse 7, he speaks about God's favor, his grace again. He said something in verse 7. He said, Lord, by thy favor, by thy grace, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. That's an interesting thought. Thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. Now, when he was on, Mount, on that mountain there, when the three days pestilence was going on, God hid his face from David. Because I promise you, nobody was praying harder than David during those three days of pestilence. Lord, please stop the pestilence. Lord, be merciful, please stop the pestilence. I can hear the cries of these men. I can hear the cries throughout all of Israel of household, women losing their husbands, women losing their sons. He's, Lord, he said, please stop it. And the, he says here, thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. Let me tell you something tonight. When God hides his face from us, we're in trouble. That's why we pray, Lord, make thy face shine upon us. The day God hides his face from Heritage Baptist Church, we're in trouble. The day God hides his face from us when we're praying and seeing God, we're in trouble. He said, Thou didst hide thy face from me, and I was in trouble. And then he said, Lord, by thy favor, by thy grace, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. And what do you mean by that? What mountain? Well, a mountain's a symbol of strength. It's a symbol of stability. It's a symbol of majesty. I mean, a lot of times we, we come up with a theme, an idea, and you can't help but notice, but almost all the time, a, a mountain winds up, or, or mountain peak or whatever, maybe a mountain range kind of crops up in there because that's what just comes to mind about great things here. So what does David mean by mountain? He could be meaning, he could be referring to his strength as a king. He could be referring to the city of Jerusalem. 
Uh, he could be thinking about the mountain, Mount Moriah, where that future temple would be built. He could be thinking about that. Whatever he's thinking about there, he says, Thou hast made my mountain stand strong. David claimed some mountains in his life. He claimed Jerusalem, which was a city on a hill, as the city and the location, a place where he would rule, the city of peace, where he would rule, and that would be the capital of the nation. Mount Moriah was told, he was told by God to choose as a place where he would buy that threshing, where he would take that threshing floor, offer sacrifices. David's thinking about that. David's thinking about the, the, the majesty that he had as a king and the strength he had as a king. He said, only because of your grace, you've made my mountain to stand strong. He says, my mountain's not eroding. My mountain's not becoming old. My mountain is strong. It's not becoming weak. It's not trembling. It's not falling apart. Listen, I think, and a lot of us, we think about a mountain, I think about the faith of David. He says, Thou hast made my mountain, my faith to stand strong. Listen, some of us tonight, we need the faith of a Caleb. We need to be like Caleb who is old and infirmed, if you would, might say. At 80 years of age, he said, My strength is not abating. My eyes are not dim. He, saw, he, said, he said to Joshua, Give me that mountain. Some of us need to claim a mountain for God tonight. Amen? Some of us said, we are, The mountain we have is, is our, we have a very small mountain. We have molehills when we need to have a mountain. We don't have enough faith. We have molehills instead of having a mountain. In fact, we've got a little anthill when we need to have a great mountain. A lot of us think, we need to have the spirit of a Caleb. So, Lord, give me that mountain. It doesn't matter there's giants in that mountain. Lord, give me that mountain. Some of us need to have that attitude. I'm going to be a giant killer. I'm going to go after a mountain. Some of us are just chasing after little things and small things. When God wants to chase after big things and increase our faith and abound our faith. Oh, listen, I'm going to challenge the men tonight. Have great faith. Climb a mountain. Go after a mountain somewhere. Do something great for God. Listen, some of you, you claimed a mountain one time, but now your mountain's eroding and the roads are closed up and the mountain, half the side of the mountain's falling off there and your mountain's not a mountain anymore because you've neglected and you haven't gone after it. Listen, why don't you just go after a new mountain, climb a new place like Joshua told the, the tribe of Ephraim and Joseph. He said, listen, you're a great people. Why don't you just go through and cut down some wood and go claim the land for yourself? I, you don't need me to give you that. You can claim it for yourself. I want to encourage you tonight. David said, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain stand strong. Is your mountain shaking? Is your mountain diminishing? Is your mountain any smaller? Maybe it's time tonight to get your mountain reestablished in God, to get a conviction. Lord, I need you to help me be steadfast about my mountain for God. By thy favor, it's only by the grace of God. David said, I shall never be moved. I shall never be moved. It's easier to move than to stay put. It's easier to move than to stand firm and stalwart and steadfast. The devil may be speaking to your ear right now. To move away. Go away. Do less. No, it's still like David, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain stand strong. And in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. We need some steadfast men and steadfast women and steadfast church members. We'll say, in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. David wrote this song to praise God. He said in verse 1, I will stole thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up. Never forget, God's the one who took us out of the sinking sand. Never forget that God's the one who lifts us up. Never forget that when we're broken and bent over, God's the one who straightens us up. Never forget that God is, God is the one when you're cast down, he picks us up. He said, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. Do you have some things to praise God for tonight? Do you have some sorrows to give to God? Do you have some praying that needs to be changed? Do you have some weeping right now that endureth for a night, but you need to claim the fact that joy cometh in the morning? Have you been dealing with a guilty conscience instead of a convicted conscience? You're concerned about God's anger and God not loving you, I want to tell you tonight, his anger endureth but a moment, but in his favor there's life. You can rejoice in the grace of God. Rest in his grace, claim his grace, and if you feel like you've exhausted his grace, he giveth more grace. I want you tonight, get a hold of God this evening. Get a hold of his grace. Rest in his mercies. Renew your prayer life. Be steadfast. Be unmovable. Always abounding 
in the work of the Lord. Tonight, if you're not saved, we invite you this evening to come to Christ. David talked about bringing, being brought out of the grave into the pit. I want to tell you tonight, if you go down to the grave without Jesus Christ, your Savior, you'll remain. You, you'll not go to heaven. You'll go to a terrible place called hell, and that's not where God wants you to go. God wants you to go to heaven. He wants you to have your sins forgiven, to know that you're going to heaven and that, that you're, you're a child of God. If you're not saved, tonight, I invite you tonight, come to Christ. God loves you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to put your faith and trust in Jesus to save you from your sins.